wandered the country, being forced ever further northwards as the Roman wars engulfed more and more of the land. They taught and they preached in little synagogues like this one. They spent a lot of their time giving advice to people about the correct forms of ritual behaviour, things that earlier would have been decided by the priests in Jerusalem in verbal argument. There are hundreds of legendary stories about these rabbis. Sometimes, too, the learned academies they founded. They were great teachers, they were great disputers. They would travel distances to see each other, to have arguments, sometimes to discuss points of law, to remember, perhaps, too, the old academies they'd been at in Jerusalem. And then there were generations of students that followed them in precisely the same way. But the most important work of these rabbis, and it was the most important work, was to memorialise on paper the ritual, the records, and the whole ethos of Judaism, the Judaism that was so near to extinction. Over several generations, all the leaders of Judaism gathered together. The scholars and the rabbis from the great cities of the East, from Babylon and Alexandria. The survivors, too, of the priesthood and the schools of old Jerusalem, all gathered now to build the sacred books into a Bible. So the first thing the scribes had to do was to sit down and make sure that the rabbis were dealing with a text that were consistent. Every line had to be the same from one version to the other, and that was quite a thing to decide on. It said that one little scribe in one night burned an extra hundred measures of oil, just preparing the book of Ezekiel for the rabbis to examine next day. The rabbis, of course, examined whole books. They had no trouble with the center of the faith, the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. They obviously had no trouble with the book of Kings and the books of Judges, these great books automatically could not but be included in the canon of religious texts. But there were later books that caused much more problems. Book of Esther, for example, had been written by a woman. That was a bit dodgy in itself. So they cut it in half and kicked half out and left half in. There was the Book of Maccabees, which was a splendid Greek history, but didn't seem too religious, so that went out. In fact, there's quite a collection of them that went out. And funnily enough, the Christians had already included them in their Old Testament. When they discovered that the rabbis had later left them out, they sort of pushed them to one side, so they became the Christian Apocrypha. But it's very difficult talking about this stuff, because you don't have any proper record of what went on. What you have is dozens and dozens of marvellous stories, especially of the rabbis that seemed to dominate the proceedings. And one of these, and typical of them, was a man called Rabbi Akiva, a man considered so intelligent that Moses himself couldn't understand him. There's a wonderful story of how actually he saved the Song of Songs, that great erotic poem, for our Bible. And the story goes that they were having a meeting and people were getting really worried about the Song of Songs. Should this marvellous piece of literature go into a sacred volume? And Akiva, who wasn't exactly known for his uh, liberal attitudes, I mean, one of, when one of his parishioners came to him and said he was con contemplating suicide, Akiva told him he used a strong rope. So, Akiva addressed the meeting, so the story goes, and he said, brothers, all the sacred texts are sacred, but the Song of Songs is the most sacred of all. What he meant was, I think, that the Song of Songs, that piece of pure erotica, should be in the Bible because the Bible should represent the whole body of man from its beginning to its end, and therefore needed something like that in the middle. So it's through these legendary debates that the Bible has come down to us today, and through men, through legendary figures like Akiva himself. Akiva came to a terrible end. This is his tomb. Seems that when the old man was about 70, he went on the war path. I think he must have decided but what he really wanted to do was to go back to the Jerusalem of his youth, when the temple was there and when the great scribal academies and studying had been all over the great city. So he got a local resistance leader and christened him as the Messiah, and together they set Judea alight. The war went on for five years. We don't know much about it. It was quite terrible. The old Jewish histories tell us that the Roman cavalry charges at the end 
The horses were wading in blood up to their chests. Some of the Jews committed suicide, wrapping their children in the sacred scrolls and setting fire to them. Kiva himself was captured. He refused to give up teaching the law, and the Romans tortured him to death. Combing the flesh from his body, it is said, with combs of iron. Well, as many Jews have done in such final moments, the Kiva started to recite the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Then he suddenly stopped and smiled. And the torturers, who were obviously not used to such things, were quite alarmed at this, and they stepped back from him and said, old man, old man, why do you mock us? What are you, what are you doing? They're obviously frightened at his power. And Akiva said, calm yourselves. I've just realized for the first time in my life a new meaning for these verses and started out on a learned exposition, the last of his life, with this old guardian of the sacred scriptures, delivered to his Roman torturers. And with that, as the Jewish history says, the old man gave up his soul to God. That sacred text was guarded by the care of scribes and scholars for thousands of years after Akiva's time. It stayed the same, though they had one major task in hand. You see, as the Jews spread out through the Mediterranean, up into Europe in the diaspora, their accents changed. So the old system of writing Hebrew, which was mainly in consonants, didn't work anymore because as people read it, it sounded different and seemed to mean different things. So the scribes, invented an elaborate system of vowels and they also started to space the words and the sentences and the paragraphs for the first time. But can you imagine the care? Really, 14, 1500 years of careful copying. And can you imagine too how wonderful it must have seemed when printing came along? How you could set up a page of type, make sure it was absolutely correct, and then print off hundreds and hundreds of copies. And so, within 30 years of Gutenberg printing the first Bible, Jews printed a Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. And this is it, a copy of the first printed Hebrew Bible, made in the 1480s, most of them. And there's the sacred text up there. And you see how it's become surrounded by this scholarship, like a great protection around the Holy Word. It's a marvel of printing. In fact, the whole book is an extraordinary story. Christians didn't want Jews printing things. They were hounded out. There was a duke in Milan who allowed a little family of Jewish printers to settle in a village called Sonshino. And from that village, Jewish printers were trained who went out with portable printing presses all over Europe, actually from Spain to Istanbul. And they printed what are now called these Sonshino Bibles in many different towns. Small Bibles, fugitive Bibles, you might say. Luther used one of these when he was on the run, when he was translating the Protestant Bible, the sort of father of all Protestant Bibles. He used the Sonshino Bible. Now, the Catholic Church, too, was very interested in the new scholarship and was evolving whilst printing was coming up. This extraordinary work here is one of the earliest examples of this new scholarship of, that went with printing, really. The Complutensian Polyglot. It's wonderful, isn't it? Polyglot means many languages. Complutensis is the town in Spain, Acala, where it was printed by a very proud Catholic cardinal. There's his coat of arms and his hat, a magnificent Renaissance title page. Now, the book is a major work of scholarship, and for the first time in history, all the versions of the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament have been brought together on one page, the three major versions of the West. Here is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text made before Christ, the Septuagint, in the Hellenistic cities. There is the Sonshino Bible, that text copied from those first printed Bibles. And there in the middle, the orthodox Latin text of the Catholic Church. The Cardinal says that these two volumes hang like thieves either side of Christ. Talking about the orthodox Latin. That's not quite the end of the Hebrew Bible. You see, the Sonshino Bibles weren't as precise as Jewish scholarship would like it. And so 20 years later, in the 1520s in Venice, a Tunisian Jew called Jacob ben Chaim edited the text of the Jewish Bible that we still have today 
And this is a copy of it. Look, magnificent Renaissance binding. This is a product of some of the finest printers of the Renaissance, printed in Venice, in the High Renaissance. And look at the title page with the new architecture on it. And there, the Hebrew language in the middle. A magnificent volume. And literally the same text, the same text you will find in Hebrew Bibles today. And there it is, again, the Bible itself, covered by the commentary. And the most curious thing is, perhaps, that he worked and was paid by a Christian, Daniele Bomberg. Bomberg believed that really the roots of Christian religion lay in this book, the Hebrew Bible. And he and his sons continued to produce these books for generations. In fact, they actually had to get special permission for the Jews of Venice to leave the ghetto to come and work in his Christian print studio. And he got special permission too for them to leave their yellow hats behind that they always had to wear outside the ghetto. Ben Chaim said of his work that Bomberg was sent to him by God. He asked me to purify the text and he said, I worked on it, I worked on it, I worked on the words, I worked on the marks and I worked on the phrases until they were polished silver and purified gold. An authentic copy must be the exemplar from which the transcriber ought not in the least to deviate. No word or letter, not even a jot, must be written from memory. Between every consonant, the space of a hair or thread must intervene. Between every word, the breadth of a narrow consonant. Between every new section, the breadth of nine consonants. Between every book, three lines. The fifth book of Moses must terminate exactly with a line. The copyist must sit in full Jewish dress, wash his whole body, not begin to write the name of God with pen newly dipped in ink. And should a king address him while writing that name, he must take no notice of him. <laughs> 